Well, it's really nice to see everybody here tonight. <clears throat> and I'm guessing at least a few of you were there last week. And uh, as you know, we had some problems. I think there was just a mistaken link set up. So Patrice was in one Zoom room and other folks were in another Zoom room. So sorry about that. And uh, it's just nice <clears throat> as we're settling in together, maybe a few more people will gather just to sense the minor miracle that you know, a bunch of us are interested in gathering like this on a Friday night. And just the uh, confidence, even if you don't feel that confident, just the confidence that there are these beautiful emotions, qualities of love that we're able to access. And this, you know, <clears throat> capacity, it isn't that all of us are special folks. So we, you know, are the special folks that have access to love. Just it's more, it's more not so much that we have access to love, but the capacity for the mind to abandon fear and anger and irritation and boredom, at least temporarily, that is an inherent capacity. We don't realize it because of the momentum of our habits of being afraid, our habits of being irritable, our habits of feeling apart. But those habits are hard work for the, you know, for the body, the mind, the heart. So it's quite natural for the heart to abandon all aversion. And this is a good way of understanding love generally, metta, loving kindness, the basic goodness, goodwill of the heart. It's when the heart <clears throat> recalls its capacity to put down that load, that heaviness of aversion, however subtle, however familiar it might be. And I thought tonight it would be particularly beautiful, fun, good, <laughs> whatever you think, to take up mudita, appreciative joy, gladness, sympathetic joy, or just joy. Because it can be, I know for me this is true, it can be the most provocative of the four divine abodes, the Brahma Viharas of loving kindness, that basic goodwill and compassion, that capacity to not be afraid of our own or other suffering because we feel empowered by our well wishing, like may this suffering be alleviated. That wish that suffering be taken care of. And equanimity, which is that foundational quality of love that knows the moment belongs. And mudita, this, like I was saying, the most, I think the most provocative for me, and it has somewhat to do with our particular temperament. But, you know, when we're, <clears throat> have those tendencies of, oh, poor me, then it, it almost feels like if I have mudita, if I'm appreciative, if I'm finding joy in the beauty and goodness in the world and in others, well, what about me? You know, there's that, oh, poor me, feeling like I'll run out if I'm appreciating you, if I'm wishing well for you. Or I don't have any to give in the, you know, to begin with. Or you know what? You don't deserve it. <laughs> you know, you don't deserve my appreciation, my well-wishing. So it's just sort of interesting when we're hurting, we don't feel like being grateful and appreciative. We're in that stingy vortex, you know, that inner gravitational pull of, what about me? Oh, poor me. And we don't have the bandwidth, 
we don't have the interest in um, looking outside of our own pain, really. I, uh, last night I saw half of a movie. I didn't finish it, uh, but I plan to. And it's been on my watch list for years and I heard it was good. And I don't know if it's a perfect movie. I don't think so, but there's some things I really liked about it. It's called Patterson. Maybe some of you have seen it. And uh, it's, uh, the, that's the name of the, one of the main characters in the film. And it's also a town, I think in New Jersey, sort of a old industrial town. Yeah, Robert recognizes it. Pretty close to New York City, right, Robert? Yeah. Anyway, so it has that vibe of sort of being close to New York City, looks pretty urban. And uh, this guy is a bus driver and a poet. But the reason I'm bringing the movie up, just the way it was filmed, it has a kind of, and I'm guessing the director and the, you know, cinematographer, the whole point was to have this flavor as if everything, just the ordinariness of this very urban environment, that it felt luminous as that, uh, as lit from within, right? Ordinary things like a brick building or urban sidewalk with, you know, storefronts or just the buzz of life, people on the street, cars, taxis, buses. But somehow the whole intention of the film, because the two main characters, a young couple th who were very seemingly very much in love and kind of quirky folk, um, but they were seeing the good and appreciating the good everywhere <laughs> in really ordinary mundane things. And uh, it was such a simple delight to even watch that film in the same way that it can be a delight to be around somebody who's appreciative. It's contagious. Like somebody who's in a, I had just earlier today, about an hour ago, we fed our cat. We usually feed our cat around 6 p.m. And, and uh, both Wynn and I just kind of stood there, not for long, but you know, two minutes watching the cat enjoy its food. You know, just a simple appreciation of there, here's another animal getting some food, taking some delight. And then here are two other animals observing this animal, the four-legged animal, enjoying its meal. And we're taking delight and the happiness of the cat. It's contagious, it, it builds. I think the Dalai Lama once said about Mudita that it increases our odds for happiness seven billion to one because there's gotta be somebody who's experiencing some ordinary success, some ordinary happiness, some ordinary pleasure right now. Doesn't have to be some profound spiritual pleasure. Could be just that they're warm and safe and we can appreciate that. And you know, especially at this time, but generally, you know, the way our mind is wired, most of our minds, most of the time, we tend to see the danger, we tend to see what's off, we tend to see what's ugly. Uh, when and I were working today and then we decided to take a walk, you know, and uh, we live close to where the center is, which is right in the middle of the city here in Minneapolis, if you're from out of town. And we walked along Franklin Avenue, which is a pretty busy urban street, trash on the streets and just a lot of the activity of a big city. And, yeah, and I just I had this, partly I think from seeing the movie last night, you know, just kind of flipping back and forth. I tend to have an aversive mind, a critical mind. So I notice the trash on the street. I notice the yards that, you know, gardens or boulevards that aren't well kept, things that need painting, you know. So, but just to notice some of the ordinary beauty in the, mo in, in the day, in the moment. And the important question is why wouldn't a human being 
get good at mudita, at appreciating what's beautiful, what's good, in an ordinary sense, not expecting, you know, extraordinary beauty all the time, but just ordinary beauty, like that the grass is green, you know, or that the breeze through the trees is a pleasant sound, or that there are buses. You know, I could be averse to the sound of a bus, but how nice that the city is organized enough to have buses running. So that's just a little introduction to this quality of the heart we call mudita. So let's go ahead and do some. And um, I'll put this, uh, I modified it a little bit, but just um, a passage that many of you will know. So I just put it in the chat. And we'll just do this one verse from the suffusion with the divine abidings or the four quarters champ but we're just going to use the one on mudita here. It's translated as gladness and we'll just say it together. And then I'll start giving us some guided meditation instructions for about 30 minutes. And then we'll check in with each other after that. And you might notice for those who chant this all the time, I changed the word mind to the word heart. And we've been meaning to make this transition in the community um, but when it first got translated, because the word chitta that's getting translated here can either be heart or mind. So let's just do this one verse. Let's do this chant together. I'll ring the bell to begin. I will abide pervading one quarter <clears throat> with a mind, with a heart imbued with gladness. Likewise, the second, likewise, the third, likewise, the fourth, so above and below around and everywhere and to all as to myself i will abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a heart imbued with gladness abundant exalted immeasurable without hostility and without ill will. And just settle into a comfortable posture. Then we'll take a few moments to begin our mudita appreciative joy practice by just appreciating the body and that we can sit and the stability of our posture. Appreciating the earthiness of the body. The breathing body, feeling that movement the breath and the pumping heart. And the buzz of the electrical nervous system, quality of vibration, sensation, subtle, gross. So as we breathe in, just appreciating the life of the body and each time with each out breath, simply appreciating the life of the body. And this appreciation can definitely be wordless. It's a simple warm inner smile as you breathe out, appreciating the body 
that same warm, generous smile as you breathe in, appreciating the whole body, the intelligence of the body that's evolved through so many, many years of evolution. You might feel the food being digested that you ate earlier. And you might find that using a phrase from time to time is supportive. So you could just repeat whatever you like silently in the heart. It could be as straightforward as I appreciate this body. May this body be at ease. One set of phrases I like a lot that you can use. May this goodness here in the body continue. May it increase. May it never end. So let's just take a couple minutes of silence Appreciating the body with the in-breath, appreciating this body with each out-breath, finding our own way, making it real as best you can. Of course, we might be in the habit of bringing to mind what we don't like about the body, but we're changing that habit now, where we're intentionally appreciating the body as we breathe in, intentionally grateful, appreci appreciating the body as we breathe out each time. May this goodness here in the body continue. May it increase and may it never end. There's an expansive flavor to all the qualities of love, mudita included. That expansion of a generous quality of love. 
So we can appreciate that too. So beyond just the body, we can appreciate this heart right here, this mind that's capable of love, capable of feeling love, being love. I do appreciate this heart of mine, this heart that's capable of being generous and sensitive, capable of being grateful and appreciative. So may the goodness of this heart continue May it increase, may it never end. And so now just switching, shifting, and simply appreciating the goodness of our heart. And we're not saying that our heart at times isn't negative, in a bad mood or whatever, but we're just deciding, intending now just to take some time and to specifically appreciate the goodness that this heart is capable of, its generous capacity, its kindness, and to keep that in mind and to appreciate it for a few minutes. And again, you can use silence if you would rather, or just a simple phrase or word. May the goodness of this heart right here continue and increase and never end. So we're learning to relate directly with the goodness of our heart now, and we're appreciating it. This heart is capable of goodness, of beauty, strength, patience, so many beautiful qualities. May this goodness continue, may it increase, May it never end. In a way, we're learning to smile in a generous sense. We're learning to smile at our own goodness, appreciate our own goodness. It's 
really important to be able to draw on our own memories. Like when you were really sweet and kind with your pet or with another person, you're really strong in a good way. Oh, this heart is capable of being good, being wise and kind. May this goodness continue and increase and never end. And we're learning not to be in a hurry. Over and over, just remembering this heart is good. It's capable of being really good. And I really appreciate that. So may this goodness continue, may it increase, may it never end. And you can just continue working with your own goodness if you'd like, but at some point it might feel quite natural to bring to mind, recall somebody you know and appreciate. And you might know this person personally, like a good friend or relative, or it might be somebody you just know through the news. Let's start with somebody that for you is easy to appreciate, easy for you to recognize their goodness or something good that's happening to them, some kind of success that you can appreciate. And don't go looking for the perfect person, just see who comes to mind. It might be something very ordinary, like somebody falling in love with a person you think is good for them to be with. And you just appreciate that good thing that's happening in their life. There might be some personality quality you see, sense in another person that you think is so beautiful. I appreciate your strength. Appreciate your clarity. May this goodness continue. May it increase, may it never end. So if you need words, you could repeat something like that in a relaxed way. But we're really feeling the heart appreciating. That's actually the meditation object. And that quality of appreciation has this flavor of expansion. It's really generous in that sense. Wants to include more and more, appreciate more and more. So working with somebody easy now, and we'll continue in silence.
And you can continue to work with this person, work with yourself, work with whoever naturally wants to come to mind. But in moments at least, you might feel that this quality of mudita, appreciation, joy, really isn't about any of the specifics. It's really a more generalized appreciation of all that's coming and going. Doesn't mean the world life is perfect. It just means that the heart, this heart right here has the capacity, this generous capacity to appreciate, to wish well, and all the goodness, all the beauty, all of this continue and increase and never end. And we're learning how to be here in the moment in a really open and generous, loving way. Not afraid to sense the beauty and goodness that's here without imagining that we're being duped. We understand what's not perfect, but right now choosing to appreciate what is beautiful and good and wishing well, may this goodness continue and increase and never end. And when it feels like there's some momentum, really practice abiding in the mudita itself, becoming this appreciation Beautiful love shining out in all directions. May all this goodness continue and increase and never end. So keep it really simple. We're sitting here, human being, choosing to be interested in this quality of love, this specific quality of mudita, this capacity to appreciate what is good and beautiful, worthy of appreciation. And to really abide or become this appreciation, this joy, and let it shine out in a simple way in all directions. So for another five minutes or so in silence,
And that opening chant that we did, it's really um, in the tradition, it's the words that the Buddha used, his instructions. I will abide pervading all four quarters with this heart imbued with mudita, this appreciative joy. Above and below, all around, everywhere and every way, I will abide, pervading the all-encompassing world with this heart imbued with joy, appreciation, abundant, exalted, boundless, everything belongs, free from hostility and ill will. I will abide. So really sensing this as a place of abiding, a real refuge for our mind and heart. We can abide appreciating, appreciating the body, appreciating the goodness of this heart, appreciating the air, the earth, the creatures we share the planet with, the dear ones in our lives, friends and family. We can even in moments at least appreciate some of the difficult people in our lives, appreciating that it can't be other than the way it is and all these difficult experiences can be powerful teachers. And again, just sensing the generosity of the heart that can appreciate what's good, what's beautiful, appreciate the happiness the ordinary happiness that beings experience. And may all of this happiness continue. May it increase, may it never end. And take a little time, adjust your body as you might need to. Whatever you need to do. <clears throat> I'll share a few more thoughts, but uh, we'll have lots of time tonight just for other people to share. You know, we have all have had and have sensitive hearts, right? And, uh, We've all learned a lot because our minds, our hearts have cycled in and out of dark places and negative emotions, negative attitudes, and hopefully, at least in moments, really sweet, beautiful, generous, clear, wise attitudes and qualities too, right? So we've all learned a thing or two about both that movement, those swings between skillful states and unskillful states, and just the effective feeling of being in a negative state like ill will or fear, and how it feels to be in a wholesome state. It's actually really important to recall what it feels like to be wholesome, that expansive, and it, it has both the sense of opening up and including, being more and more inclusive, these wholesome states of mind. But it also, it seems paradoxical, but it all, these wholesome states also have a kind of solidity too. We feel when we're in a good place, right? We feel powerful, like there's a natural stability when the mind is in a skillful 
place in the same way that when we're in a really off place, a dark place, it's, uh, it doesn't feel stable. Part of being in a difficult place, a negative place, is we're always feeling like this restless quality, which tends to make the difficult state worse, right? But it seems to require it. You know, this hunger, this fixing, this controlling, this restless activity. So uh, I'm inspired by this simple statement. I guess Eleanor Roosevelt spoke. That seems like somebody with some real wisdom in her life, uh, the wife of um, Franklin Roosevelt. And uh, the simple line, the giving of love is an education in itself. Right? It's like we have to unpack all the weird erotic ways we've gotten in the habit of thinking, like I mentioned at the beginning tonight, like I don't have enough to be loving, to be generous, to be appreciative. I'll run out of love. I'll run out of whatever. Or you don't, the world doesn't deserve my gratitude, my appreciation. I don't have any to give, you know. So these, these are very compelling ideas. And we, what we imagine we have to do is I have to deal with all of those neurotic habits before I can actually touch into mudita, appreciative joy. But I think that's, that's really can be a mistake. It's like, oh, I have to be perfect before I can experience the simple, you know, happiness of a wholesome state of mind, a wholesome state of heart. And I think what the, the Buddha might say is that the way we support the healing of these deep habits to be aversive, to be afraid, to be neurotic, to be anxious, right, that we have, is to realize that there's another abiding for our mind and heart. So when we recognize, like, it's not even so much, okay, I've got to get myself to appreciative joy, as much as it might be to resolve to notice ordinary moments of gratitude and joy during the day. Like really be aware, oh, oh, look at that. I didn't think I was capable, but I'm actually in this moment, there's some appreciation here. There's some real gratitude. And you see, it really challenges the, ba the basic um, premise of our negative habits, which is that's who I am. That's all I am. I'm anxious. I'm afraid. I'm greedy. I'm, you know, whatever whatever the mind might think. But when we uh, intend to notice ordinary, generous, loving mind states, heart states, then it really challenges that conviction, that diluted conviction that I'm screwed up, I'm bad, I'm negative, I have a lot of ill will, I have a lot of fear. As if it defines us in a you know, in a permanent sense. This is a famous poem. I'm guessing most of you have heard it. Um, St. Francis and the Sow by Galway Canal. And it's, it, there's just some powerful wisdom in it, which is why it's such a well-known poem. And it really starts with this image of the bud, the flower bud. And just uh, the potency, you know, we probably know that feeling. Maybe you have some in your garden or in your windowsill, a, a flower that's budding. And there's, uh, there's that sense of possibility there in the bud. So the poem goes, the bud stands for all things, even those things that don't flower. For everything flowers from within of self-blessing. 
though sometimes it's necessary to reteach a thing its loveliness. Oh, I really love that. And that's what uh, I thought of this poem, you know, from that movie I mentioned, Patterson. And just the way it was filmed and just the basic point of the film was, was a little bit of that, like uh, reteaching all of us the loveliness, the lovely, loveliness of being. And it doesn't, you know, the loveliness of being actually doesn't require different circumstances. It requires different eyes, like a different way of seeing. We have to take off our glasses that are filtered to, you know, highlight aversion <laughs> or what we might be averse to things that we're afraid of, things that we're disgusted by. We have to take those glasses off and see with fresh eyes how alive it is. You know, when we look at the sky or the clouds or the leaves or birds or whatever, there's nothing inherently beautiful about those things as opposed to the trash on the street or the bird poop on the car but we're conditioned to interpret them, you know, as beautiful. It's really interesting how that is. I sometimes tell the story, I don't know if you people here tonight have heard me tell it, but it was just a striking moment and I was probably like eight or seven. And uh, back in the day, this is, you know, early 60s, mid 60s, um, and walking back and, uh, we, you know, you didn't take a bus, you actually walked to school, walked home from school. And I was walking back from school, just an ordinary neighborhood in North Minneapolis where I grew up. And, uh, and I just remember looking, you know, I was walking by myself and we had sidewalks there and, you know, just like seeing the sidewalk, seeing the grass, to about as ordinary a phenomena as a seven-year-old would see, you know, nothing special in the grass, in the sidewalk. But I had a little bit of this, like reteaching a thing, it's, lo uh, it's loveliness, you know, like just seeing something, seeing the beauty. But see, the, we often think that the beauty is in the thing, but the beauty is in the way of looking. Like it's, it's that capacity to be intimate and then things start to feel alive and are beautiful because they're alive. You know, when we're looking at the sky with a certain attitude with our, you know, diluted glasses or aversive glasses or greedy glasses, you know, it's, it can be a real pain, the sky, the clouds, the breeze, doesn't really matter. But everything has this quality of being alive and beautiful. But we don't think that. <laughs> and we're arrogantly certain that it's just, you know, a sidewalk, just grass, just this, just that. And our delusion, our conviction that it's just a sidewalk wins out. But for whatever reason, for a few moments as I was walking home, and this, you know, just as a kid, I didn't know what was happening, but it's like the moment came alive in a way that moments were never alive. It happened a couple of times around that age. And I, of course, like I said, I, I didn't have a clue what was going on. Um, but, but it was just, uh, you know, being mindful that's probably what it was. And so the mind not caught in its thought about things like, Hey, I'm just walking home and this is just a sidewalk. Right. And everything came alive. And the, the only thing I remember is the aftertaste, which is a sense of awe and wonder and beauty. But I didn't understand it because it was, I was just walking down a block. I've walked down hundreds of times, seeing the sidewalk and grass. And, you know, back then, Grass was just grass. There was nothing fancy, no flowers or 
you know, nice edging or anything. <laughs> it was just a sort of straightforward lawn and a sidewalk, a city sidewalk. And the, the poem, if you haven't heard, it goes on this way, right? So I just, I ended up with that line. Sometimes it's necessary to reteach a thing. It's loveliness to put a hand on the brow of the flower and retell it in words and in touch. It is lovely until the flowers again from within, until it flowers again from within of self-blessing. As St. Francis put his hand on the creased forehead of the sow and told her in words and in touch, blessings of earth on the sow. And the sow began remembering all down her thick length from the earthen snout all the way through the fodder and slops to the spiritual curl of the tail. From the hard spininess spiked out from the spine down to the great broken heart to the blue milken dreaminess spurting and shuddering from the 14 teats into the 14 mouths sucking and blowing beneath them the long perfect loveliness of sow. <laughs> I love that poem. And I don't know if you've ever, I have a lot of relatives, both of my parents grew up on farms. And so we used to every summer go visit our aunts and uncles. So I got to spend some time, even though I'm a city kid on farms. And it is quite a thing. Maybe you've seen it in videos or maybe you've seen it in person to see these big pigs, you know, with their little piglets, you know, and, and, you know, it's like these things, spiders and earthworms and mosquitoes, we can be totally annoyed or frightened, but we can also be completely in awe. The wonder of a simple spider in the windowsill or, and it's not about the spider again, it's about the way the way the mind is showing up, the way the heart is opening. And it's okay to, to sort of project that the spider is beautiful or this person is beautiful, but we don't wanna get attached or arrogantly certain that there's something special about the spider or something special about this person, something special about these particular clouds. Some of you know Doug McGill, he's a good friend of mine and uh, has been running the Rochester, Minnesota Meditation Center for a long time. I think it's been in existence for about 15 years. And uh, he has uh, a bumper sticker on his car that says something, I, I forget exact wording, but it's something like I stop, uh, this car stops for interesting cloud formations. <laughs> and he is, he's somebody, he's got, I don't know, thousands of, from his camera, you know, I mean, his phone, you know, pictures of clouds that are interesting to him. You know, it's just like, brings him delight. Yeah, so it might be nice, like as we move towards um, open discussion time, it might be nice for folks to think about times when you had that, turning of the mind, you know, your mind was operating in a very ordinary way, which may, means we're mostly lost in our thoughts about things. And then for whatever reason, something shifted, something opened up and the heart, the mind was able to abide in the loveliness, appreciate the loveliness, the wildness, the openness, the inherent beauty of the moment. And whether it was a specific thing that helped, like we might be, oh, no, 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 it was that particular tropical, you know, evening on the beach. That's what was actually beautiful. Or was it? You know, was it the heart that was opening that was actually beautiful? Or was it the particular sight or the particular sound or the particular touch? What makes a moment worthy of appreciation? And yeah, just any questions, any reflections about what we've been doing tonight?
be really nice to hear. And uh, why don't we go ahead, uh, you, uh, maybe you don't know, but you can open up participants at the bottom and you can just raise your hand and that way we can go down the order of people who raise their hand. Um, so you can go ahead and raise your little blue hand by clicking that under participants. And Ravish is first. If you want to start off, you can just go ahead and unmute yourself. Thanks, Ravish. I think it will. And, you know, the, the whole idea is that we want to prepare ourselves for every scenario that comes our way. And there are millions and millions of people who are suffering, I mean, really unimaginable difficulties and experiences that people are bumping into right now. And there are children playing and friends laughing and you know, people being sweet to one another and, and just all kinds of interesting things. The whole world. We've been lucky. There's um, a pair of Brinkel hawks right in our neighborhood, which is very close to common ground. And then they had uh, three, um, what do you call them anyway, babies, baby hawks, ringtail hawks. So now there are five terrorizing the neighborhood. And, and it's so interesting. We go back and forth between just so appreciating these hawks everywhere. I mean, they're swooping around and, and, but they, they have this really intense screech and, you know, just it's, you know, every other day they're killing a blue jay right in your yard, you know, and then all the other birds are swooping around trying to get them away and carrying away mice and, it's like, and here we, you know, this is right in the middle of the city that they, these birds of prey have kind of been making a comeback over the, the decades. And it's like, in one minute, we're just total appreciation of these amazing animals. And the next moment, we're horrified and, and moved by the blue jay that just got caught, you know, and the same thing, our cat catching little bunnies or chipmunks or mice. And we so love the cat and are so horrified by the killing machine. And uh, so how much more so with the human, you know, success and happiness of other humans and the very real suffering. And so this isn't like learning how to appreciate what is beautiful is just one way of helping our heart become nimble so we can really show up in life. We don't, we don't need all those habits we picked up along the way of closing down and having a fixed view as a way of protecting ourselves from how wild it is, where in one moment we bump into some horrendous suffering, just maybe just listening to the news or flashing on something or getting a call. And in the next moment, the heart should be nimble and be able to appreciate something that's simple and beautiful. And then who knows what's in the next moment, one moment at a time like that. That's the ideal, not to be stuck with the world is miserable or the world, you know, this idealistic set, oh, the world is beautiful. Not to have any fixed idea at all, but to have a heart that nimbly is responding to whatever the heart is sensitive in that moment in a beautiful, generous way, whether it's a, the generosity of compassion, because there's we're touching in, noticing a lot of suffering, responding to suffering, or the generosity of mudita, this appreciative joy. Thanks for getting us started, Ravish. And it looks like Tim. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, it's really interested when, when we do have a real experience of joy and appreciation, uh, it's really useful to get interested because um, the idea is to go from like the person who's appreciating to becoming the appreciation itself, being the joy instead of owning the joy. Because when I'm identified with the joy, 
then those next moments when you know we're dealing with the bureaucratic part of life as tim suggested and you know gave the example it can feel like a betrayal like something was taken away so but so the idea is to to really develop the capacity to abide to be the joy and not hang on to it at all and so when the moment changes you know and we're we're sort of realizing the well let's just paint a bleak picture let's say there's really no function in the charts that tim has to fill out i'm guessing there may be a limited value you know that could be brought to mind but let's just assume it's just a bureaucratic task that got institutionalized that that it, that helps nobody right so there would be be very appropriate for there to be some compassion for everyone caught in this bureaucratic system that you know just makes people jump through hoops for their own you know for no sake whatsoever and and to let the heart be touched by the craziness of that you know like one of kafka's short stories you know just really abs the absurdity of people doing stuff that isn't going to be helpful let it break our heart a little bit so that that can be seamless because both have that expansive generous quality like when the monster of bureau bureaucracy shows up honey i'm not afraid of you because I know how to be generous, like, yeah, there is this enorm enormity of suffering, enormity of ignorance that is moving here. Just like a moment before, just feeling the vibe of that, those beautiful healing moments and just ap being appreciative to, of just being able to be part of it, right? As the healer and that, but really, I know that feeling when healing happens, and you were in the role of being the healer, it's, we're not even identified with I did that. It's just like something beautiful happened and I'm really grateful to have been able to sense it. You know, it's just that not non-grasping. And so that's the idea is that we're not afraid of the bleak and miserable, terrible sides of life because we know this generous way of connecting with it, which we call compassion. Compassion is not a heavy state of mind. Compassion is a very beautiful state of mind that arises when the heart is proximate with suffering, close to suffering. But that's not our topic tonight, but it's really, it's really important to, to point out. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Who'd like to go next? And while someone's going to raise their hand, I, I don't know if you noticed, Mary put a comment in the chat. There was a wonderful report on uh, today about how incredibly beautiful parasites are and the role they play in all of life on the planet. But we, but we don't usually think of them as beautiful. Yeah, exactly. And uh, some of you know, you know, just in the last 20 years, there's been a real revolution and understanding the importance of the gut and the bacteria, you know, which are basically parasites in our gut. Um, but just the health of that whole ecology of the intestines and the bacteria that are there, totally. And even on our skin, I think there's all kinds of creatures. <laughs> Isn't it funny how it freaks us out? This is great to get to know scientists and doctors who are kind of into this stuff, you know, and how they can delight in, in things that, you know, many of us have been conditioned to be disgusted by. Yeah, please, Rick, go ahead. Well, exactly. And and just the way you talk about it, you know, that's what we have to do. I mean, even something simple, like when I was reading the poem, uh, some of you might be thinking, oh, I, I, I want to get that poem, right? And it's like a shift from appreciating the wisdom of that poem and the skill of the poet who wrote the poem to a 
graspy, and they're like two different people. This is the thing about these different mind states. It really teaches us that deepest, you know, leads the heart to that deepest insight into impersonal nature, anatta, that some of you know that word from our early Buddhist tradition, this teaching that experience, inner, outer experience, never, ever, ever refers back to anybody or anything in a permanent sense, right? So when we, like Rick was pointing out, when we see moments of appreciation and then instantaneously a moment of appropriation and then maybe more appreciation, more appropriation or any kind of switch, like another time, uh, it's sort of interesting. You see this with children, but also with adults where there's just, they're really enjoying something and then it's a little too intense and they start to freak out, you know, and then, and they're sort of going back and forth between fear and a kind of joyful excitement. Have you seen that in yourself or in children, right? And it's like really interesting to see like, oh, there isn't just one person here. There isn't just one way one set of eyes or many possible sets of eyes. And that's really good for us to be like in a group like this to point out for each other and remind each other because then what that does, seeing that thousands of times in the course of our practice, then whatever particular set of glasses we have on, on this moment, like the glasses that allows us to appreciate or the glasses that makes us stingy and wondering why you have more than I have, we know, we start to know that, hey, whatever reality I think I'm experiencing, it's not the whole truth. It's just arising because of what's showing up and how the mind is relating. And it could be a different reality if there were a different set of eyes. And it kind of begs the question, like, what's a good reality to help create right now? Because the attitude, the way of relating is always in play. And that's kind of what we're doing with these four Brahma Viharas, the four divine abodes of metta, loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy that we've been talking about tonight, and equanimity. When we get pretty confident that these emotions are available, then, it, then we sort of, as we move through the day, it's sort of like, okay, what might be useful? But whenever we're practicing with mudita, that tendency towards appropriation is going to come in. And you maybe even noticed wanting to own, like when you, if you felt some of that expanse of joy tonight during the guided sit, you might have noticed wanting to claim it. Like, okay, this is who I am. I'm going to be this way all the time. And what we want to do when we notice that appropriation, we want that serene smile. Oh, honey. Oh, honey. You're also the angry monster, right? You're the frightened child. You're the, you know, stingy, miserly, whatever. You're the jealous, this. We're all those, we have all of those patterns. And a lot of them are pretty well greased. <laughs> Just waiting for the appropriate stimuli for it to get activated. Any other thoughts, Rick, before we move on? Thanks, Rick. Nikki, do you want to uh, share something with the group? Yeah, because we're, um, the, the common example that's given is how people who are really calm, you know, there's a lot of people get irritated being around people who are really calm. And the same thing with people who have kind of a sweet, generous personality, you know, stingy people find them threatening in a way. In a way, they're mirrors. Um, and, and, we can't avoid but sensing the contractions that our mind, because of habits, have sort of gotten comfortable with. 
and that and you know and it they remind us how tight the body heart and mind is and uh so we tend to want to strike out we don't want to be reminded and this is the terrible you know sort of ultimate deal with the devil is we've just because of causes and conditions we've all in in order to survive psychologically we've all invested in not so skillful personality traits emotional habits right and they're really tight painful and then uh, we practice staying busy so we don't notice how much pain is involved in having these emotional psychological habits we stay busy and then every once in a while we bump into people or situations that make it obvious how tight how heavy our emotional psychological habits are it's like why people don't want to do meditation or don't want to have a quiet evening you know with the internet off and the phone put to the side right because we're left feeling what we've always been feeling but we've been too busy to feel and uh you know part of getting on this path of awakening is a deepening willingness to feel what we're feeling and to appreciate people who mirror mirror that back to us or situations that allow us to have a more honest relationship um with what with what's going on and then we can start using people like the friend that you mentioned Nikki because it's like oh i want to be around that person she used to irritate me but now i want to be around her because i she, she helps me remember how these strategies are stressful you know the strategy of being having ill will or being angry or irritable i don't want to be that person and it's more obvious when i'm around her so i'll see it and it's really good and that's where you know ideally we'll end up having a lot of these teachers that will mirror back because that's not who they are these tendencies will really stand out you may not want to see it but might be ultimately very happy to be able to see it it looks like you have the last words Yeah, I loved hearing that Robert and how many of us now when Robert was talking appreciated Robert and that whole scenario that Robert described, right? And this is the thing what I said earlier about how contagious it is. Like so somebody like we got a little window into the goodness of Robert, right? And and just taking the time to appreciate Robert it just grows like that because when we're appreciating robert that appreciating itself is beautiful like right here we're appreciating robert but appreciating robert is also beautiful and on and on and on carolyn you get the last word i guess but it has to be quick Thanks, Caroline. So nice to see everybody be together.